Every so often in the street, someone sees me with my white stick, comes up to me and offers to give me my sight back. I'm usually quite rude to them. It rather depends what kind of day I'm having. But the idea of the miracle cure runs very deep. On the 18th of September, 1709, a baby boy was born above a bookshop in Lichfield, Staffordshire. It was an anxious birth, a difficult pregnancy, and the mother was already 40. Things didn't go well. The baby was weak and failed to cry. His aunt famously declared, I would not have picked such a poor creature up in the street. Thankfully, he survived. The baby became one of our greatest writers, Samuel Johnson. Judith Hawley is Professor of Literature at Royal Holloway University of London. Samuel Johnson, the great writer, dictionary maker and critic, was born as a very sickly child and very shortly afterwards contracted scrofula, which is a disease which affects the lymph nodes and leads to terrible swellings on the neck and skin complaints and left him half blind and half deaf. And when he was two and a half, his mother, on the advice of a doctor, took him up to London to see Queen Anne and she touched him for the king's evil. And this meant that, first of all, he was blessed by the queen's chaplain and then the the doctors examined him and the queen literally touched him. But it seems quite strange that in the 18th century, you know, the century associated with enlightenment, people still believed this. Yes, the idea that the king could actually cure you of a disease probably goes back to Edward the Confessor, who's thought to be a miraculous king. And the practice went on at least until about 1714, which is the date of the death of Queen Anne, the last of the Stuart monarchs. And Johnson himself, of course, this was quite a key moment for him, wasn't it? He sort of boasted about this and had relics of it, as it were. Yes, he often told the story and he was given a gold medal as a kind of amulet (laughs) to wear around his neck. And he wore this medal for the rest of his life. And it's in the British Museum. You can still see it. Of course, the touching had absolutely no effect at all. And the poor man was left horribly disfigured and scarred for the rest of his life. What I find fascinating is that Samuel Johnson that great 18th century rationalist, carried on wearing that medal even though he didn't believe in it. Well, there's a triumph of hope over experience. But you find that hope going back hundreds of years to the earliest accounts of what it was like to be disabled in Britain. Medieval historian Irina Metzler has been collecting thousands of miracle stories. Since the establishment of Christianity, there's been the idea that the relics, the leftovers of saints, which can be body parts, part of clothing, or even objects that were associated with that holy person, a cup or a favourite book, anything like that, that these relics can work miracles. It's almost like a magical power. God works through the saints, and the saints can heal people. So... For over a thousand years, people with all kinds of disabilities and illnesses or anything troubling them were taken to shrines in the hope of being healed. Would they need to be people of the higher sort or would anybody who could walk to a shrine, for example, would they be able to take advantage of this? There's no social restriction. A shrine is open to absolutely everybody. The question how you get there, of course, is tied in with your means. If you're wealthy and immobile, for example, you can hire a litter. There's uh, interesting descriptions of how people actually got to a shrine. In a cart, in a feathered bed that was suspended between two horses, carried by other people, in a wheelbarrow. And people really went in the belief that going to the shrine of your favourite saint, as it were, that really could work? I think we have to suspend our modern rationalistic and sceptical disbelief. To all intents and purposes, people did believe that at least there's a hope that they might be healed. There was a woman named Matildis. Owing to the curvature of her spine, she was quite doubled up and her legs were twisted together. Peter, the priest, had long housed her by way of charity and supplied her with food and clothing. If she ever desired to visit some shrine for the recovery of her health, he used to have her taken there, laid like a sack across a horse. Laid across the horse like a sack, these miracle stories 
give us details of the daily lives of disabled people in Britain. They were written by monks as advertisements for the particular cathedral, shrine and saint, so every cathedral has its own archive. This one's from Norwich. When the fame of St William of Norwich was spread abroad, she conceived the hope of being cured by his means, and with eagerness took her stick and started for Norwich. Each step was hardly a finger's length. She was slower than any tortoise. But at the moment of her entering the cathedral church, she felt the soles of her feet pricked as if by thorns. In a way, the miracle stories are emulating the gospel stories. So virtually all of these cures are based on the healing of the lame or the man, the paralytic man, the man born blind, that's in St John's Gospel. The saints are imitating what Christ did. And behold, some people brought Jesus a paralytic lying on a bed. And when he saw their faith, he said to the paralytic, Take heart, my son, your sins are forgiven. He then said to the paralytic, Rise, pick up your bed and go home. And the man jumped up and went home. Your sins are forgiven, you're healed. The link between sin and disability is there in the teachings of Christianity and in many other religions too. What we can't know is how much people really believed this and applied it to their friends and neighbours. It's a matter of some debate among historians. In practice, even in the Middle Ages, attitudes could be more forgiving and people more tolerant, as Irina Metzler has been finding out. One thing I think we we need to dispel is the myth that disability is caused by sin. I looked at nearly 500 individual stories in Miracle Stories, and only about four or five out of 500 mention sin in connection with disability. For example, the builder of the cathedral in Canterbury, William of Sang, in uh, the 12th century, um, he was inspecting how the building works were progressing, climbed up on the scaffolding, scaffolding gave way, and he tumbled down over 50 feet, broke his back, so he was paralysed. Nobody in any of the sources that tell this story, accused him of doing anything sinful. It was just, oh, poor chap, he had some kind of pension written into his contract. He was sent back to France and another William, William the Englishman, came in and finished the job. What about in terms of having a child with a disability? Isn't there some element of blame being put on the parents? Yes, and it's interesting, it's all on the parents, it's not the child. The the reasons that are commonly given in the Middle Ages for why this happens is basically all due to the wrong kind of sex. (laughs) For example? Um, Any kind of sexual practice that the church would have labelled as deviant, and there are loads we could go on for hours. Give us some examples. (laughs) Sexual activity while a woman is pregnant, during menstruation, on Sundays, on a saint's feast day, during daylight, you can go on and on. So anything that's improper could result in a defective child. So given this dichotomy in a way, how do blame and compassion play out alongside each other on a day-to-day level with disability? Well, what we mustn't forget is that the the sources, the texts, are written by people who are intellectuals, who tend to be churchmen, who have an axe to grind. People down to earth would have had a much more pragmatic approach. People rarely seem to have abandoned disabled children. So I would argue that people in the Middle Ages were much more pragmatic, almost turned a blind eye, dare I say, (laughs) um, to to the, the church's teaching about what may or may not be sinful and in a way got on with their lives. But the idea that illness and disability were the just deserts of sin, especially sexual sin, didn't go away. Onania or the heinous sin of self-pollution and all its frightful consequences in both sexes considered. This book was extremely popular in the first half of the 18th century. Licentious masturbators may be identified by swarthy and haggard complexions. In women, 
and meagre jaws, pale looks, feeble hams, and legs without calves, a jest to others, and a torment to themselves. A book to be kept well away from your wives and your servants. But as the 18th century progressed, the idea that disability could be cured miraculously met with increasing mockery and scepticism. With the development of a more scientific worldview, religious ideas of disability shifted. Professor Judith Hawley. One of the things is there's a new understanding of how the body works, how it's put together. From the Middle Ages onwards, or even even earlier, there's the idea that the body is composed of four humours that have to be in balance. And if you have an excess of one humour, such as the spleen, you'll be an angry, splenetic person. But advances in science, a greater number of dissections, experiments with electricity, new views of how the mind and the body work together, led to a new understanding of the body as being composed of a network of delicate nerves. So this network of nerves operates both in the disabled person and in the viewer. And there's a belief that when you see somebody who's suffering, your own nerves will tremble in sympathy, almost like strings vibrating when you play a violin. As the bow goes over the strings, your nerves will jangle in sympathy with the suffering person. So to some extent, this is associated with the fact that doctors are beginning to say it's not somebody's fault, as it were, if they're disabled. It's not necessarily a part of them. It's some external disease. That's right. So it's, it's, people often blame the parents. It's either the sin of the parents or their own sins, which has led to this deformity. And doctors are really starting to say, well, no, it's actually it's a physical malformation that doesn't necessarily imply a preceding fault, moral fault. But I wonder whether the hope of miracle cures has ever really gone away. It's just that people look to doctors instead of saints. When you read early doctors' advertisements, what's striking is the way they deliberately echo biblical language. I have made the only true discovery of the cause and cure of ruptures. I cure faults of the testicles, falling out of the womb, and make the weak strong and the crooked straight. I seldom visit till seven at night, nor then without a fee. That medical advertisement is from the late 17th century. The growing power of doctors and the extraordinary cures and inventions they advertise is something we'll be coming back to in this series, as is the idea of a cure. But for some disabled people in the 18th century, a cure was the last thing they were looking for. They were doing very nicely, thank you, making a lot of money exploiting their unusual bodies on the streets of London. 